<laughs> but but my point really is is the fact that we can't see intelligent life puts a figure on how likely intelligent life is to survive. Yeah. My guess is very rarely does a planet last long enough in a quiet period to not be knocked back to the goop level. Yeah. You know, because if, if a 100-kilometer object hit Earth, <laughs> it probably wouldn't wipe out life. It, it, it would certainly send it back to the... But it, we'd yeah. go back to the goop level. Yes. And <laughs> unless we... I mean, it, there might be a few people who last a generation or so I, I, I know. I think 100 kilometer, it would literally... It would be people in the space station, they would run out of supplies. You know, that would... Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it pretty sobering. It's bad, and yeah, yeah. But and, and the point is, there are lots of thousand-kilometer bodies. You know. This well, is, there's only one that's serious, which uh, has the mysterious white spot on it. Okay, you are right. Yeah. Can I just say, uh, let, let's just. What do you think that white spot in series is? Have you thought about it? I think it's incredible. Okay. Do you don't have a an idea of what it might be? I think there there are lots of. I think the most likely explanation is slightly quite dull. I'm Sirius sure it is will be. very, very high in ice. We know that. It's far enough out that yeah. it has... Kind of oh, it's very out. likely. It could be a relatively recent meteorite impact that has melted and then reformed the ice, which is quite white to the... Because when you melt things, there tends to be a sorting, chemical yep. sorting. So I think that's sadly the most likely. But the most dull. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, so I, I actually am in that camp. It is right in the middle of a, an impact crater. Yeah. And if it's a very young crater, it could be that it's either exposed something or uh, has remelted. It could be a heavy iron meteor or something, but we have it in the middle of a crater. It's something like that. But it's not quite central. It's offset. Well, there's two pots. There's, two parts. And there's, there's two one parts that's in the middle and there's another one. And the other one, yeah, that's a little more interesting. Well, not necessarily, because quite often bodies, um, they bounce... Mm -hmm. If you look, um, well, that, that, if you that, look at the impacts on uh, on Jupiter, we've seen some that bounced actually. You know, we've seen ones on Earth yeah. where we've seen no, 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 they bounced. Actually, that's not true. Okay, forget this. We've seen it where uh, objects have broken up in the atmosphere and they've, they've created two impact or three yeah. or four impact craters. The, and Jupiter was a great example because yeah. the thing got tightly disrupted. Is Shoemaker Levy 9? That's right. Yeah, and that, that was an amazing event. So just to explain what happened there is the object doesn't necessarily come straight in. It can quite often come in in a curved path. That The gravitational force of Jupiter broke the thing apart because an awful lot of asteroids are, and comets are not very strongly bound. They're not unlike cigarette ash, you know, they're being separated yeah, out. Cigarette ash is separately. what I heard, yeah. And so that can also happen. So that might also happen with Ceres. I, I think, yeah, possibly. That I, I mean, they seem rather close together for that, but we will find out. That I just wanted to take this aside because maybe he's right. Well, Maybe he's wrong. It'll be awesome if you're right. It's a guess. It's a guess, and that's great. It's and, great, but it might be. It, it could be something else that is unexplained. I mean, yeah. what I found really exciting when, because um, during my time at university, the, the voyage, wonderful Voyager probe. Oh man, well, that was amazing. But I even, was like ten years old. I was loving. You know, yeah. <laughs> We were but, all loving that. But the, the, you're right. Uh, during the earlier part, I was as well. But the, I'm, I'm 51 now, by the way. I'm 42. You know, yeah. it's not so, that far. But there was when they when it arrived at Triton, and we saw the geysers and all that oh. thing, as far out as Neptune. That was uh, firstly cryovolcanism was, was just such a revelation. But the fact is, it was expected to be a relative decrescent dust bowl. Right. And so I I thought firstly it was fascinating. Secondly, it wasn't what we expected. So I'm, I know it sounds stupid, but I'm expecting something we don't expect. <laughs> yes, and that is actually the best way to be a scientist, right? Yes. Is to expect the unexpected. But it's still, it's perfectly fine to have theories to explain things. Yeah. Because even yeah. when we get better pictures, as as because I think the probe's going to go in orbit, is it? Today it's going to go into. It's it's getting very soon. I haven't. Yeah, it's very tried, very soon. We are all very excited. But anyway, the point is, we will get much better information. But I'll have a private bet that it still doesn't explain it. It'll take a while to actually yeah. really get to the bottom of it, for sure. And it may well be that we need to see the um, 
the reflected light, looking at the characteristics. See if there are any obvious absorption lines. Yep. Try and see chemically what it is. It may well be water ice. Yeah, we might have to send another mission to actually take a sample of this thing. Maybe it'll be the white spot for a long time. Yeah, that is quite possible. And, but it's, it's interesting because it shows science is quite important as well because it could be some other thing that we don't expect. It could even be a volcano. Which I think is very unlikely, by the way. I, I very I, cryovolcanism. <laughs> There's nothing to drive it. There's nothing to drive it. I mean, unless it's a well, a, a impact we think. crater, recent impacts, maybe. Well, one of the things that um, I thought was quite interesting is looking at the changing the subject again slightly. Okay, that's I, okay because we love this, right? I love the idea. This guy is awesome, right? I gotta say, right? <laughs> that's, that's very, very kind. We haven't even talked about machine code yet, right? <laughs> I love the idea that we can terraform Mars. I do as well. I, I, so I looked at quite brutal ways of doing it um, and trying to, and this is where my knowledge of the physics and the material science of the Mars, firstly, we don't really know what the distribution is. But taking a very, very large chunk of ice, yes, attaching a rocket motor to it. Well, actually, all you need, yeah, you, you could use a, a motor that actually just melts the ice and uses that as reaction. Mass. Yes, you, you can. Well, exactly. You, you dig a hole and you yep. get the steam as your reaction. Yes, yeah. it Brilliant. can take years. It doesn't matter. But if you were to drop it on one of the poles of Mars, it would, as it approached Mars, it would pick up at quite a speed anyway. Yeah. And so a huge amount of energy would be dumped onto Mars. And it would, for quite a long period of time, it would be at a very high temperature. And I'm talking about half a million years. Yes. It would be above the melting point of water. So what it would do for an area of many tens, if not hundreds of square miles, it would stop CO2 condensing. Uh, right, yeah. And so it would put CO2 into the atmosphere. And that CO2 would have quite a profound greenhouse effect. Yeah. Gradually, over tens of years, raising the temperature of Mars as a first step to terraforming. Yeah. And then it's not, you know, we, we criticize genetic engineering, but I don't think it's beyond the wit of humanity to find or engineer microbes that could then live at that super low temperature. I, I'm pretty sure we've already found microbes that could actually survive. That's right. Well, no, no, it's not surviving. They've also got to give off gases that, that preserve and increase the amount of oh, CO2. Like methane. Yeah. Methane. Yeah, okay. A really powerful greenhouse yeah. gases. Doing what? The things that we hate on Earth. Yes, I know. It's exactly <laughs> what we need on Mars. Of course, on Venus, you want the opposite effect, right? You want to take yeah. all that carbon dioxide and bind it up. And I, I personally think Venus doesn't work, sadly. The, the real it problem takes too long. That's yeah. the problem. It just takes hundreds of thousands of years. And losing energy is much harder than trapping it. Because the energy is there. It's coming in from the sun. All you're trying to do is reflect some of it back to the surface. Yeah. With Venus, it's a whole order more complicated. Venus is already has less sunlight getting to the surface than on Earth, right? Because the clouds yeah. reflect so much. But they and also hold it. They hold it so efficiently. Yeah. So if, if I were betting, I would say Mars is a way easier target. Yeah, then, and also if you think how hot Venus is at the surface, all that stored energy has to be lost. Yeah, damn hot. And the other problem is all the things that we like to live, all the chemicals we need to live, have largely been boiled off Venus. Well, so the hydrogen is what's been lost, right? Yeah. So the water, because you've lost, didn't have water in the atmosphere, the, the CO two didn't precipitate out, yeah. right? A lot of the oxygen has been lost as well. Yeah, the hydrogen. Well, there's a lot of carbon dioxide, and that's got oxygen in it. That's but true. the carbon didn't get bound up in rocks like it did on Earth. Yeah. So Venus has lost a lot of hydrogen. That's really the main thing. And hydrogen is a very useful thing because you can make water with it. So I think it's quite hard with Venus. I mean, you could still take a large... You could take Ceres, even. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> Maybe that's... Because I've had this conversation with people before, and they said, uh -huh. what an act of incredible vandalism. Well, so, okay, defiling so, Mars, defiling Ceres. Okay, so here's my take on terraforming. I, I made this public a couple of times. Is it? Um, I believe that we will develop the technology in the future to do this, but I believe that we will also develop uh, the ability to have you know, 
live in space and, and yeah. have enclosed habitats well before that. I agree. And it's far more efficient from a mass and material standpoint to build those kind of habitats than it is to, to uh, colonize Mars by terraforming. And at that point, people will say, wait, Mars is this pristine wasteland, let's preserve it as a national park or whatever. And I think it would be uh, more likely to, to, it's less likely to be uh, subject to terraforming, simply because people will like it the way it is. Right. As, as you know, and, and to that, to us, to our 21st century people, it seems like a step back. Right. But I think if you're living in the 25th century, it may not, it may seem totally obvious. Part of me agrees with you, but I think we're looking at it from our present day sensibilities. One of the things that, and it's slightly depressing, is we're in a transitionary period. Currently, we're ruled by governments. Oh, yes. Which are democratic, relatively speaking. Relatively. Um, Depends how much money you have. Well, that is the problem. Because of the rise of corporations, when corporations start to take control, which we, we, we're not quite seeing, but there is one route where that's the case. And that's the future route that with Frontier and the Elite series of games, I've assumed. Right. That would be the Federation? No. Oh, no, it's okay. The corporations, the rise of the corporations. Right, well, wait, so, Did you so, read the history that was with Frontier? I, I, I did. I, ten, <laughs> I can test you on it. Ten years ago? 20, no, 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 20 years ago? Oh, my God. So, I'm the, terrible. The, what that postulates is, sadly, there will be a world war. And it's... I mean, it, I think that it... I'm trying to remember, Frontier showed the history... As this decade, because don't forget, this was written in 1990. Yes, of course. It was always a future. It's the decade of religious strife. Back in 1984, Khan was was ruling the world, right? Before we <laughs> sent him off to Boston Bay. I mean, you know, future history, 2001, 2010. Yeah. yeah, they're history now. Anyway, the, 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 the point is, something's got to happen, the current trajectory we're on, to change what we are and it, it, it's got to be some quite major event it might be and what would be great is if it's done by consensus it's just the cynic in me thinks it won't be anyway the, you're right it, but it, I think if corporations are in control if you can terraform Mars relatively cheaply it would happen it would happen okay even if governments were against it I can totally buy that totally but then you know, then again, I do like total recall with the whole cell <laughs> charging for oxygen. But I think what would happen is you would have domes preserving parts of Mars' surface. Oh, wait, wait. Like the other way around. The other way. Oh, that might... Oh, that's a good idea, so the, actually. The national park would be inside a dome. Maybe like a super low pressure. Yeah. Okay. And because what... This is why this guy writes games, because he has the imagination, right? No, it, it, well... You're, you're, again, you're being very kind, because one of the things that is interesting about the almost all of the rest of the solar system yeah. is it's been preserved for a very long period of time. Yeah. So if there is anything out there, or was anything out there in terms of alien interest, there might be something out there, yeah. and it would have been preserved, because it could have happened anything, any time in the last few billion years, wow. and it will still be up there. Yeah. So it's not impossible we might find things on Mars that surprise us. Well, buried, buried in the dust. As a scientist, I always want to find things that surprise me. Yeah. But I think, you know, this series is going to surprise us. I really hope it will. I hope, ironically, it won't be what I'm saying. That it's just oh, you're hoping it's not a la uh, an alien with a laser pointer shining it. Well, that'd be great. That would be great, but it could be... It would the change The implications things. would be very... Yes, it would change <laughs> things. Right? But I think most likely it's a patch of ice or something like that. A, a crater has either exposed or created because it's melted and then it's really yeah. cool. Um, because anything white is very unlikely to survive in space. Because it will, it will heat, it, you know, the, it will reflect, but more importantly, the radiation, um, if it's... If it, it will tend to darken things. Yes. Yeah. yes. Because a lot of carbon compounds like CO2 get dissociated by cosmic rays yeah. and things like that and tend to end you tend to end up with molecular carbon on the surface. Yeah, and people don't realize just how dark comets yeah. are. Like when you when you uh, make cameras, you get a special kind of paint for the interior that's like very very black. 
many cometary surfaces are as black as that because of the very fine carbon compounds on the surface. Even comets, active comets like Halley, I remember, yeah, they're, just, they're, they're blacker than anthracite coal. That was yes, the figure I heard. It, it, it's insane. It is. And you just think, well, that's pretty damn black. Yes! How much more black could it be? Yeah. None more black. But the idea is, and you can sort of see it, if you ever made a snowman, yeah. it starts off beautiful and white you know, with the carrot yeah. and Three days later, it's gone actually quite all, dark. All the dirt is what's left. That's right. And the dirt gets preserved, whereas what happens is the ice gets essentially burned But on top off. of that, any complex carbon compounds are getting subject to cosmic rays, and That's then right. they get yeah. broken up and you get molecular carbon, right? Yeah, so it's actually worse in space than your, yes. your, your, your snowman. Yeah. But the, the, great thing, um, the great thing with that, though, is... It's understanding it. It most likely ends up with quite a hard crust yeah. around it because of this. Almost like a baked Alaska. Yeah. Have you seen the, the pictures of, of uh, the Rosetta probe? I have. They're amazing. They're stunning. Can you can you say the name of the comet? Uh, something with Gerasirov. <laughs> it's Chermier of Gerasirov. That's the one. Something yes. like that. <laughs> I've had so many pra so much practice of seeing that by now. Well, it, it's. I think that's an amazing thing to have done. It's a real shame. And, and it's European as well. That's right. It's a real shame that Philae, or I, I still don't know how to say that properly. It will, it will be back. It will be back. I really hope it will yes. be. Because um, although looking at the pictures, I think there are a few locations it could be in which aren't very Better good because they're quite deep. Uh, yeah. And it's almost certainly on its side from the picture it took before yes. it shut down. Yeah. And so... But what I'm hoping is it will be just long enough for it to wake up. Yeah, yeah I, fingers I, crossed. I wanted, I wanted to give us more information. It was so brave, like letting itself go and landing in that scary environment. Well, the fact that it bounced such a big. Yes. But I think that's interesting that, you know, contrasting that environment, and it does look like the Comet 67 uh, yeah. is, um, <laughs> is relatively pristine because you can see there are features. Um, that are a relatively constant size that matches a lot of the theories of like planetesimals. Yeah. And how that when a solar system is forming, there are these sort of snowflake-like objects that stick together because they're, the gravity between them is exceedingly low. But also they're very soft. Yes. Like cigarette. Cigarette, yeah. And they gradually coalesce. And that's possibly... And then they gradually come together. That's possibly what's happening. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, comets, yeah, comets form out where uh, they, they haven't had the ability to... They collect into comets, but they're so far out that they don't collect into larger objects, yeah. right? Just, whole... just changing the subject slightly again. Oh, Whoever's oh, still listening, well done. Oh, you no, clearly well, care about I astronomy. I think this will have to be in two parts by now, right? <laughs> I, I, you know, this is going to go viral, by the way. You're, you're going to be all over the... The mind boggles. What rubbish have I been talking? It's the beer, you know. It's the beer. He, he's got Corona. I have Pliny. Uh, well, Pliny the Elder. By the way, Pliny the Elder is 8%. So Eight Scott percent. is doing I, really well here. I, <laughs> yes. Wow, we've been going a long time as well. This yeah. is like 40 minutes, this guy. Yeah. But, uh, and actually, it's probably a good time for us to finish this up. Now, it is. Well, it's, we it's, a, it's a great trap. We've, we've talked... <laughs> this, this guy is awesome. I love him. And, and as I said... Like, and we've hardly talked about games. We haven't talked about games at all. Okay, i, I got to say, right? I've been doing this for everyone else. Okay, yeah. so David Raven, like, I've been asking everyone else, what you're doing here, you're here to promote Elite. Yeah. And it's, you know, won the award, so you've seen it there. And we won the Audience Award, which I'm right. really grateful and very, very proud of. Right. Okay, Think about this. What is the coolest thing you've seen that you haven't worked on at GDC? Um, I loved some of the indie games, actually. They, uh, they were quite very, very pretty. Yes. There was one, and I'm, I can't remember his name. Okay. But it, the rendering style was so lovely, okay. and it was quite sinister. I loved mm. that. It was, um, it was during the awards, and they, sillyly, they gave the name, and then they showed the pictures, and I, I, I apologise. Oh, I man. We're going to have to find out which one Yeah, it is. but I, I did like... Um, some of the others as well. There's um, the one that looks like Escher. Okay, uh, it's Escher. Uh, was it uh, Monument Valley? Monument Valley, yeah. yes. Yes, well-deserved award. That looked quite interesting, yeah. Yes, it's great. 
totally worth playing on your phone when you're commuting if you're if you don't drive. And also, you know, I I didn't see it at GDC, but I played it recently. Alien Isolation is a lovely game. Oh, I love that, and I love playing the old one. Alien is one of my. Oh, I know. It's, it's a fear, and I haven't played movies, it. Yeah. I haven't had enough time to play it very much, so I don't know how it unfolds. But the first bit is really yeah. sinister. I, I I'll, I'll admit I got that game, and I only got there's the DLC, which is just the Nostromo from the original Alien. Oh wow! Right, and there's two missions in that, and that's all I've really had time to play. Oh, it's, excellent! Oh, it is so good, and the audio. The audio is great. I, I kept on dying early on because I had my headphones back to front. Well, we <laughs> are very lucky. We have a 7.1 setup. Oh, and it's, wow. it's brilliant. Oh. It works very well. It's yes. really frightening. But Alien is one of only two movies that ever scared me. But that, What's that the other one? The thing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. I like yes. that as well. You're, oh, wow. This, the, the whole scene with the blood and the, the whole yeah. thing. You're like, which one is it? It's so dense. Um... It's okay, so, and, and the final question I was going to ask is, uh, San Francisco, what's awesome about it? Best city in the world. Oh, wow, really? But you don't live here. No, um, I don't particularly like London as a city. Cambridge is a city, it's a town, so that's it's right. a Oh, okay. That's you know, um, you get great I energy? love you can walk around it. Yes. It's very friendly. Yeah. It's, the climate is interesting, it's not always the same. Yes. Um, I love sailing. Oh, sailing around you come out and do some sailing here. I'd love to. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of sailing here. It's also, I mean, most, and don't get me wrong, I mean, American cities are all different, very interesting. But it's that sprawly cities are also, they're not as not as interesting to walk around. Obviously, Boston, you can walk around it. Totally. But, I don't know, some, some Boston has some Cambridge as well, oddly <laughs> enough. I know. That's where, uh, who's, who, there's some game studio in Cambridge, I'm thinking. I forget it, never mind. Yeah, I've never heard of one. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, obviously, MIT is great. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah, they're under, you know, eight feet of snow right now. No, I know, so I hear. So, yeah, PAX East, uh, you're not going to get there. No, I'm... I'm No, there are people from Frontier, as we speak, setting up at PAX East. They've dug themselves out of the It's the first time we've got two shows running at the same time. Wow. But you're not going to make it. But that's... I'm so glad you came here. David, seriously, I'm going to end this bit. Lovely talking to you, Scott. This this has been great. Like, we could have just kept talking. Ever. And as I said, we haven't even touched on games or programming or like. Yeah. yeah. Dude, you're awesome. For another I, time. Excellent. Another Thanks, time, we're going to talk more. Well, I say. Excellent. Great. Well, there you go. They're going to do it there together. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. <laughs>